are spending a lot of money on spinach and kale. And that was where the idea came, maybe we should start a garden. And um, I get a little obsessive about things and obviously and I that's got obsessed. What happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so through the course of doing this, we um, basically carried around all of these books that we linked to in the app here um, with us constantly. And we had to like find information from different places and not just those books, but also I went through a master gardener class. I uh, met a lot of people like Bill Ferris and followed him around and just learned everything I could from him and, and just all these different places. And we wanted um, one place to have all the information. Um, and I, I've, I've worked in software development pretty much my whole career. So for me, that idea was I needed to be an app. So. Um, we started working together on, on building our app in July of 2017, uh, and we released it last year, and this is it here. So this app will walk you through how to grow over 100 different foods. Um, whenever you choose what, what you want to grow, uh, you tap on it, and it'll give you planting dates that are uh, customized and calculated for your location. So we have a database of, um, of weather stations all across the country. And we use that to determine your planting date for where you live and then show you the planting dates. We also have all the other information you need about how to grow it right there in one location, including planting information, all of that. We also have information about how to harvest and cook with each, um, with each food. And that's really Carrie's expertise. I got good at growing it and then bringing her a big pile of stuff. And she got really good at making it taste good. So we've got a lot of her recipes actually in the app. So if there's more tab over here, pulls in the, um, the, the videos and, and blog posts and things like that that we have that are about that plant. And those are being updated all the time. We also have uh, a partnership with Burpee where we pull in the varieties they have for each plant. You can shop from them. And we have, uh, in this friends tab, we have the, um, the good companions for each plant. So these are the things that grow well next to each plant, next to that plant, as well as the things that do not grow well next to each plant here in the bad tab. We also have a pest tab that shows you uh, all the different pests that attack that plant. And then you can tap on it and it'll tell you how to handle it. And we don't recommend any pesticides in the app. We've, we've grow our food without pesticides. We rely on things like uh, beneficial insects and companion planting and just smart planting strategies to, to keep pests under control more than, more than putting chemicals down. Um, you can also see which plants are affected by each. Like obviously, asparagus beetles. <laughs> it's asparagus. Um, but um, so yeah, that's that, that's what our app does, and, and we're going to use our app during this presentation to go through and talk through different things that we like to grow and and cook and eat in our garden. So we're going to start by. Well, do we want to go out? Let's start with uh, what we have in our garden now okay. and what we're cooking now, and then kind of work forward through the rest of the year and just talk through different things. Okay. So let's start, off with, um, let's start off with kale, because kale, again, was one of the first things we started growing, and it's something that we actually planted in our garden last year, in October and November, and it overwinters. It does fine in Oklahoma. Kale comes from Russia, so it doesn't care about our winters. It, it does fine with them. And um, it survives all throughout the winter. Now, it doesn't really produce a lot of leaves starting um, around December. It, it pretty much stops, you know, mid-November, depending on when it really gets cold. But, um, and then it kind of goes dormant, and then it comes back alive in February. Um, you can also plant kale in the spring. So we're bumping up to about the end of the time that you can plant kale. Um, but traditionally, right about now is, is, when you're, is when you're planting kale. It doesn't tolerate heat very well, but it does survive through the summer. It just doesn't taste very good and it doesn't produce as well. Um, but it is, uh, it's a two year plant, so it comes back, it, it does last through the summer. Um, you can also plant it in the fall. It's a popular time to plant kale as well. Um, you wanna talk about how you make tail kale tastes good because that was one of the challenges we had in the beginning was figuring I know, out. I know everybody always laughs. They're like, kale, ew, gross. It, I feel bad for kale. It gets a really bad rap, but um, it's actually really good if you grow it. And, um, and what we like to do is just mix it up with spinach or with lettuce and however, you know, and we combine it all into one big either like taco salad or a chicken salad. Um, we even add kale into like a homemade chicken soup, chicken noodle soup. Um, we, we add them to stir fries a lot too. They're, they're real tasty. 
Um, another thing I want to mention about kale is that its taste is heavily impacted by the temperature outside. So whenever it gets colder, it gets sweeter. That's how the plant uh, stays alive through the winter is it replaces the water in the plant with sugar. So that's how it sweetens up. Um, is our phone doing something? It's ringing. <laughs> our daughter's trying to FaceTime yep. us. So. <laughs> um, so kale will sweeten up as it gets colder. Uh, the, the adverse is also true, where in the summer it will not taste very good in the, in the heat. So um, traditionally in the summer we'll switch to other greens, like collard greens typically do a little bit better. But also you can stir fry them and that helps the taste too. So if they are bitter, you can stir fry and that'll help. Stir frying um, anything just makes it taste better, I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing about kale is it's really great to grow as a microgreen. So if you haven't heard of that, the idea is that instead of growing a plant all the way to full size, you grow it to about three or four inches tall, and then you cut it and eat it at that point. And there's a couple reasons behind that. One, it's, it's a really easy way to grow a bunch of nutrition stuff in a small space because you can sprinkle all those kale seeds in a flat and then grow a bunch in one place and harvest. Um, but also, whenever you eat kale at that plant, you're getting the maximum amount of nutrition out of that plant possible. Because once the plant gets full size, it has the nutrition of the plant spread across everything, right? But when it's that size, it has everything that was within that seed, plus two or three rounds of photosynthesis. So you've got, a, you know, it's, especially this applies with like sunflower seeds. Sunflower seeds are nutritious, but what, once, if you take sunflower seeds and sprout them, their, their nutritional value increases. So the same principle applies to pretty much all these, you know, kale, broccoli. So broccoli is another one too that you do as a microgreen. Um, so that's another way that we grow kale as well as, as, a, as, as a microgreen. And there's a lot of different varieties of kale. Um, if I go into this varieties tab, you can see that there's all sorts of different types. Um, they all have their, their own unique flavor to them. So if you've tried kale before, um, and it was only from the grocery store. It may have been a variety you didn't like. This dinosaur kale here, I guess it does, it's the Lacinto. This top one is called dinosaur kale. It's another name for it. Our but son likes it better when it's called dinosaur kale too. So. He likes dinosaurs <laughs> a lot. Um, and then the, uh, the, the, red, the white Russian kale is, uh, is, is really good too. So I believe Bill actually has some kale for sale here at the Home and Garden Show if you're looking for some uh, inside the greenhouse. But, um, as far as planting kale is concerned, um, you, you want to avoid planting it around other plants that are in the same family. So that's broccoli, cauliflower, other, you know, other plants like that because they have the same pests. Um, and uh, the main pests you're going to find with, with kale are going to be the cabbage worms and the cabbage butterflies, these white moss here. Um, that's the biggest challenge you're going to have with them. They're easy to control through one of two methods. One is either covering them with insect netting. Um, so you can buy insect netting. I'm sure we have a link to it in here. Um, this floating row cover is right here, insect netting. So this stuff you can just lay over the kale and then that'll keep the bugs out. You can also make a frame of sorts out of uh, like PVC pipe. You can, um, we have a guide on our YouTube channel that shows how to make these PVC domes. Just Google that or search for that on our channel. But, um, another thing you can do with, with kale is use um, this BT is what it's called. I, I never get it right when I say it. We don't have a link to it here, but um, BT is this naturally occurring soil bacteria um, that lives, in, like I said, it lives in the soil. And whenever caterpillars eat it, it kills them. Um, well, they, it's a bacteria that feeds on caterpillars. So, but it's completely harmless for humans. Um, and you can spray it on your plants, and when the caterpillars eat it, then they digest that and it kills them. Um, so that's something else. Again, it's a completely naturally occurring soil bacteria, so it's not a chemical or anything like that. Um, so yeah, I think that pretty well covers it on kale. Is there anything else we need to say about kale? No, Any questions so. about kale? All right, so let's move on next to talk about spinach. And spinach is very similar to kale in how you grow it, meaning that um, you plant it around the same time. Uh, typically, we do all of our spinach from seed. So again, we'll start it in October or November in the fall, and then they'll overwinter and then come alive in the spring. But what we also do is plant a new round of spinach in the spring. The reason for that is, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the spinach that went through the winter 
is going to be quicker to go to seed than spinach that you plant in the spring. The spinach that hasn't been through a, a winter yet just, just doesn't want to doesn't want to give up yet. So, um, so you will have spinach deeper in the summer, whereas the transplanted stuff is going to bolt pretty soon. Uh, what are our favorite ways to use spinach? I mean, obviously, spinach is used in a lot of the same ways as kale. Um, one difference, though, that I really like to do is to chop it up and add it into scrambled eggs. I do scram I, I scramble eggs and I add in some some spinach and then I also do some chives in there too. So good, tastes great. Um, I mean, you can also add it to all the same things we talked about before: soups, salads. I mean, spinach is very universal. You can add it to pastas. And out of everything that you can grow in your garden, spinach and kale have some of the highest nutritional value for you. So um, you'll see at the top, we've got this section here, lists out the health benefits the plant has. When you tap on it, it gives you more information about it. And you can see all the different things that spinach helps with. There's a lot in there. I think we have a bug with a repeating. Yeah. <laughs> Oops, okay. Okay. Um, what else are we going to say about spinach? It's very similar to kale, like I said, with, with how you grow it. Um, it doesn't have the same pests. The cabbage moss aren't going to attack it, but you will have aphid issues with, um, with spinach. So with aphids, they're really easy just to spray off. That's the easiest way to handle them, to spray them off, and they're weak climbers, so they're, they're not going to come back up. But the problem with aphids is that they're born pregnant. So if you forget one of them, then you've got a problem in like two or three days, they're all back. So, um, so uh, typically what we'll do with aphids is, is we'll just spray them off, but really we're looking for ladybugs to come handle the problem for us because la uh, ladybugs eat, that's their primary diet is aphids. So um, by now our garden has become a sanctuary for ladybugs. We've got them everywhere. But the first year we ordered them on Amazon, you can get like 2000 on Amazon. And then we, you can keep them in your fridge and release them sporadically over a week or two instead of releasing all at once. And there's some other keys to releasing them yeah, too. Yeah, if you release them at night, they usually stay in your garden more because they don't want to leave at nighttime. And they only fly during the day. And then they day. find their, yeah. their feast and they're like, oh, I'm happy here, I'm gonna stay. <laughs> yeah, and you leave, so if you leave water there for them, they have a happy habitat because they're, they're, waking, they're waking from, um, they've been asleep for a while, right? So they're ready to basically just to uh, eat, mate, and die, and then their babies are gonna, or they're gonna be the main ones they're gonna eat. So the babies, when they're born, um, look pretty wicked. I'll, show, I'll pull up a picture of them here. Because the first time I saw one, I was like, what is this thing? It's right here. Yeah. <laughs> so if you see one of those things, I know, I know. <laughs> I know, it looks bad, right? <laughs> yeah, but these things eat, like, I don't remember the numbers, but it's like thousands oh, of aphids insane. in their lifetime. Yes. So yes. that's the key is so getting these those, things going. And that's why sometimes if I see aphids, I won't spray them off because I want the ladybugs to show up and they need some food. If you get rid of all the aphids, then the ladybugs will go away. So there's a balance there. Um, so uh, another thing I'll, I'll do too is uh, our first year that we had a garden, all that we had back there was food for us. We were battling a lot of pests. Then the second year we started adding just a lot of random other plants and beneficial insect attracting plants and just things like that. So then the pests were spread out across everything and not just the food. So the aphids would be on the morning glories. Well, we just let them hang out there, then the ladybugs would show up. And so it, it gave us more of an ecosystem for the pests to play with instead of just our plants. Because our yard before that was grass and plants. So that's one of the benefits of having a bunch of other stuff around your yard too. Um, okay, so what else do we say about spinach? Is there, are there any questions about spinach? I wanna talk briefly about how we plant spinach because we do plant it different than a lot of the other things we grow. So, you know, things like tomatoes and peppers, they take up a lot of space and you have to really be particular about where you put them and, and account for how big they're gonna get. With spinach, we don't care, we're throwing seeds everywhere. And anywhere it comes up, it likes growing in the shade. So it's a really good undercover plant or understory plant that we have sprinkled all around the garden. Uh, they're nine per square, so that's two or three inches apart. So um, uh, it's, we have spinach growing everywhere and we have a lot of different varieties of it too. Uh, they have some varieties that grow really big leaves that you can use as a tortilla replacement in a, in a wrap or something like that. And they have other varieties that 
our best to harvest is baby leaves because they're really tender and sweet and taste better that way. So um, there's, I'm a bit of a collector of spinach. I think I've tried all of these varieties in here at this point. <laughs> Every time we go to a store, I'm, I'm seeing if they have a variety I haven't tried yet. It's just... He's not joking. He's not joking. <laughs> <laughs> we planted like 10 times. So spinach will not grow in full shade, but it'll grow in part shade. So it only needs three to four hours a day, really. So it's, what's that? Kale needs a little more sun, like it needs like four to five, but, it, but it, it'll, handle, it'll handle shade. Um, the, the way that we, so the way I think about shade with plants like this isn't in the sense of like there's a wall and there's always shade there every day. It's more of a sense of there's a tomato plant here that's gonna get big and there's gonna be shade here in a month. That's a good place to put spinach because then it gets a break from the heat. So I'm always thinking about what can I plant on the, uh, on the west side of things so they get shade. And, uh, did I say that right? I always say it wrong, west, east. Like, I know it in my head, I just can uh, never remember which one it's called. The point, what is it, the west, west side? Yes, so, so on the west side of the house where it gets shade in the afternoon. Um, I'm always careful to put stuff there that is like spinach or kale that by the time it hits summer, it needs that shade. So some of our spinach, maybe like 30 to 40% of it is out in full sun, but the rest of it is in an area that's gonna get shade come summer or in a smart pot uh, that we can move into the shade once, once the temperature changes on us. Okay, so let's move on to another plant now. just planted some carrots. Carrots, yeah, yeah, let's talk about carrots. So um, it's, a little late to plant carrots now. I mean, you might be, you might be able to get away with it, especially if you um, plant a variety that is uh, that's short, like a, a fast growing variety. Uh, carrots don't love the heat too much, but if you get them started now and get them germinated, then you'll have more success. Really, um, we, we prefer growing carrots more in the fall because carrots, again, like kale, they'll sweeten up as it gets cold. Carrots are 16 per square. Um, let's grab our seeding square and talk about it for a second. So carrots are something that we use the seeding square for quite a bit. So square foot gardening is the gardening methods we started with. And basically the idea is that you take each uh, square of your garden and uh, or you break your garden up into squares. And then each plant has a certain number that can be planted per square. So carrots are 16, uh, tomatoes are one, spinach is nine so you get the idea and with the ones that are one and four and i don't really need this too much but my ocd really likes it when i have this for carrots otherwise it takes me longer and i'm doing all sorts of stuff so uh, this is also awesome for kids we taught our two and three year old her colors and her numbers and all of that through this um, it also just helps with teaching them math in general and uh, it's so it's twenty dollars i think we, link, we, like we have that, a link yeah. to it in our app um, they're really good people to make this too. We become friends with them in a way. They're pretty cool. Um, okay. So carrots, my favorite way to make carrots is to chop them up and actually add them with sweet potatoes. And you saute them in some butter for a little bit in a cast iron skillet and then roast them in the oven for a little bit. It tastes amazing. Our kids just devour it. It is so, so good. What herbs do you add in normally with them? So sometimes I add a, um, a cinnamon basil is my favorite thing to add to carrots because it has like that cinnamon e flavor and it, it it makes it taste almost sweet it's really good i think we use rosemary a little bit yeah, too we use rosemary yeah. yeah we like to use rosemary with them as well all right any questions about carrots before we move on i think we're at a 30 minute mark we can do a drawing okay let's do a giveaway if you don't have a ticket yet get a ticket we're doing a giveaway for a free smart pot where is Let's get Patrick. one of our smartphones. Patrick? Okay, does everybody have a ticket? Okay. okay, so we're gonna give away for two right now. We have, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. Gotta tell them what they're winning first. <laughs> <laughs> All right, first we have a seven gallon smart pot. So this size is great for basically any individual sized herb um, or plant for that matter. Now you can't really fit a big tomato or squash plant in here, but other than that, you can fit most anything in here. Um, this is a, a particularly great size for, um, so we'll have like four or five of these size that we'll put inside of a kiddie pool and then fill that up with a couple inches of water. And then it's, it'll drink water from below. So it's a really easy way to irrigate in the summer. Um, okay, seven gallon smart right, pot. Here we go. 347. 
Got Ooh, a winner. We have a winner. So this smart pot is a 15 gallon smart pot. And for this one, you could do a couple of things. So you could do a, you know, a really big tomato uh, or squash or pretty much any size vegetable will fit in here. Um, you could also do like a, an herb collection of sorts. So you have like rosemary, oregano, sage, thyme, all in here. But pretty much every smart pot that's this size or, uh, or larger for us becomes a big bag of potatoes or sweet potatoes because it's just so easy to grow them in it. Uh, typically, if you grow potatoes in the ground, then when you go to harvest them, you dig and you end up cutting one accidentally and you've ruined it. And, uh, but with this, you can just dump the whole thing out into a barrel or something and your kids love going through and, and digging for them. It's like an Easter egg hunt. So that's what we use these for. Um, all right, and this go. one goes to? 352. 352, nope. Okay, 343. We have Ooh, a winner. winner. Yay. All right, if you did not win, we're giving away more here in 30 minutes at three o'clock. We'll be, we'll be giving away more smart pots. So if you don't want to take it yet, hour. Yeah, and do winners get another, can they get another ticket? How's that work? We didn't talk through all we the rules. We did not talk through that rule. So no. many complexities here. <laughs> so many complexities. Hey, Patrick, you can have this back now if you want. My other iPad is, is working. We do all of our carrots inside of our, um, our raised, uh, the wooden raised beds because they require the, the automated irrigation. So... Uh, we, we do carrots in these over here, these large. So we consider those raised beds, basically. I don't do carrots in these smaller ones, but I'll do them in the big smart pots. And I have automated irrigation for those. So you can do them in the other ones. It's just for me, when, when I grow carrots, I want to have a bunch of carrots. So I want to fill that whole thing with carrots, basically, is the way I view I'm not looking to grow like a square of carrots. I'm growing a bunch of carrots um, at once. And then another thing we'll do with carrots that I want to mention is we won't plant them all at the same time. Uh, we'll stagger the plantings by a week or two. That way they're not all uh, done at the exact same time. So, yeah, just yes. like radishes. We do the same thing with beans, um, with cilantro, a couple other things too. There we go. Okay, I bumped the thing. Okay. So while we're talking about potatoes, do you want to talk about potatoes? Or? Let's do it. Now I got this little holder, fancy. <laughs> Make it easy. All right, potatoes. So we just finished planting all of our potatoes, although we noticed when we went home uh, that our dog dug them up while we were at the show yesterday. So, so we will be replanting. Replanting potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> so I told everyone we were done planting potatoes yesterday. That was a lie. <laughs> so typically potatoes, we are done planting um, on St. Patrick's Day. So that's, a, that's an easy way to remember, just plant all your potatoes on St. Patrick's Day. Again, we plant pretty much all of them in the 20 gallon or 15 gallon smart pots. Uh, we have some for sale over here, by the way, the, the 15 gallons are the smallest we have for sale here. We have the, the other larger ones too. Um, but potatoes are really easy to grow. Um, the way that you plant them is by buying old potatoes, basically. Uh, and you could, you, I'm sure you've seen this before in your, in your pantry where they start to have the sprouts. So, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> each one of those becomes a new plant. So each potato will produce two, three, sometimes four new plants. So uh, just take a potato. No, don't take one from the grocery store because oftentimes those are sprayed with chemicals that keep them from sprouting. So, and they, that could inhibit growth. And now if you go to an, like an organic grocery store, buy it from there, that should be safe. We've done that in the past. And that's sometimes an, an easy way to find cheap seed potatoes of unusual varieties, like purple ones. Which Those are her are my favorite. Favorite, yes. And not just the color. Well, kind of the color. I am partial to the purple, yes. But it is beautiful, but it tastes really good too. And the purple color comes with nutrients that we don't often get. Um, and it's it's uh, out of all the potatoes, you can grow the purple and the blues are some of the ones that are best for you. So. It's just fun eating like purple or blue mashed potatoes. <laughs> it's so weird. Like the kids yeah. are always like, what? <laughs> it tastes great. So the way that you plant them is, you know, like one potato is going to have, you know, imagine two eyes coming off of it. Cut that potato in half and then set that on the counter and let it callous over. It'll take about five to seven days ish, I guess, depending on. Yeah. But the point is you don't want to plant that immediately in the ground because that's an open wound on the potato and bacteria from the soil can get into it. So when you let it callous over, the potato naturally does that and then it's ready to be planted. 
So you can put that in the ground. You space them four inches apart in one of the smart pots. So in one of the smart pots, we'll basically fill the smart pot halfway up and then put one all around, make a little shape, and then fill it back up. Um, and then that's pretty much all there is to potatoes and then just keep them watered. And, mm -hmm. um, and they do re they're really, really easy to grow. Sweet potatoes are pretty much the same way. Well, we'll talk about sweet potatoes in a bit. They're different, but we grow them in the bag the same way once we have the, the starch for them. Um, you can harvest potatoes early. You don't have to wait until they're fully developed. Uh, you can harvest them as new potatoes. In a smart pot, you would just basically have a segment of it that you harvest in that area and leave the rest of them alone. Um, that's what makes that easy. One thing I want to mention too is the um, potatoes can, if, if, they, if the sun gets to the potato part, it turns them dangerous. If, if, a, if you ever have a green potato, that can, it can really hurt you, don't eat it. So that's why uh, oftentimes potatoes are mounded because as they grow, you'll start to see potatoes. So one way you can help with that in smart pots is by planting you know, halfway the, the smart pot halfway, filling with soil, and then as they start to grow, just continue adding soil to the smart pot. So, um, especially those larger, like the 20 gallons, half of a container is perfect amount of soil to get it started. And then that also gives you um, some protection of sorts for the plant because the, the sides of the smart pot will be some wind protection and, and things like that. So, uh, another thing I want to mention with potatoes is if you get start, if you start them in March and we get uh, a late freeze, and they all die, don't worry, they're gonna, they're gonna send off new eyes. Just leave them in the ground, they'll come back. So if they die off, they'll, they'll be okay. As far as, uh, as cooking potatoes, I mean, obviously. I, I think everybody knows how to eat a potato. I mean, <laughs> mash it, bake it. Yeah, I mean, we know what to do with potatoes. Yeah, one of my favorite so. things though, I don't know if you guys have ever tried it though, is adding chives to, to it. So good. and. And these right here, this, these are chives too, but a lot of people don't know that these purple flowers are edible and they have the most amazing flavor in them. So if you add this to the potatoes too, so good, so good. <laughs> she likes yeah, things that are purple too. I get very excited. <laughs> <laughs> she loves purple food. <laughs> as far as um, things to plant with your potatoes, we planted, so the way that we did most of our potatoes, again, we did the, the 20 gallons, but we did a couple bags that were that size of potatoes. And then those, we sprinkled seeds for basil around it because um, they're a great companion plant for potatoes. So um, uh, pests with potatoes, there is a potato beetle, this thing here. Um, yeah, it's, they're pretty easy to control through hand picking. Uh, you can also, I don't think we have the trap on here, but the trap should work for it as well. There's a basic in insect trap you can build that's a, a yellow solo cup, like the you know, solo cups you drink out of. They have yellow ones. Um, and the reason why yellow is important is because it looks like a flower to an insect. I mean, it's a yellow thing, it has an opening like a flower. And it really looks like a flower if you get some cotton swabs and put essential oils on it. Uh, clove is one that seems to really attract them. So they smell that, they really think it's a flower. And then you've got, you put glue all around the outside. They have this sticky glue, this uh, tangle trap sticky glue. We've got a link to it in the app. It's under cucumber beetles. Let me go to that sure and show this trap in there. Um, and you can basically just paint the outside yeah, so the, we have, we have the, the cucumber beetle traps on Burpee, but you can also, the, this tangle trap stuff, you can paint the outside of the cello cup. I know we have blogs about it. And uh, I know we've got it there somewhere. I was going to say, I know there's a blog there. There it is. Oh, yeah. So that sticky glue is what goes on the outside of it. And um, the one concern I had about it when we first started was that it would get a lot of beneficial insects tangled up in it. Um, every now and then we'll see a moth or something that had its wing on it. I've never seen butterflies or anything like that. We get some fruit flies and stuff like that, but I'm not losing sleep over the fly situation. Yeah, even though they're beneficial, I got to draw a line somewhere. <laughs> and flies are my enemy, so I decided that. Um, yeah, I <laughs> heard that. She said mine too. Um, okay, potatoes. Anything else we want to say about potatoes? Okay. Um, onions. Onions. We just planted a bunch of onions. Well, well our I, I say the that, but yes, our, our three-year-old did most of the planting. She's better at it. She's, She's down really at their good. level. She's yeah, got the she right size finger. Because the way you plant onions, it in there and... it's really simple. We, 
So there's 16 per square. So we take this and then this device here, which is the same size as her finger, basically, you just take it down in the ground about two inches or no, about an inch for onions. You don't want to plant them too deep, but they, they, they come in these little sets. So it's a bunch of like 25 or 30 onions. And each one of those goes down into there. Um, you want to keep them really well watered while they're being established, especially. Um, and then you can back off once they're, once they're a little bit older. You can also start them by seed um, in the fall and let them overwinter. I've never actually done that. We've always just bought the transplants. Um, as far as cooking onions are concerned, I mean, I think... I, yeah, we add onions to everything. I mean, well, onions and garlic. So usually if I'm adding one, I add the other. And then I saute them and then add them into, I mean, stir fries. I mean, even, I mean, gosh, everything. I feel like I'm always chopping onions in, the, in there. Yes, onions and garlic pretty much go into yeah, everything we they're eat. They're very universal. Um, one thing, let's go ahead and switch over to chives and talk about chives next, because one thing that- Everybody knows my love for chives. Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you may wonder why you need onions and chives, right? The onions make tops, like, why aren't those good enough? That's kind of what I thought when I first started growing. And basically it comes down to this. Onions that um, are meant to produce bulbs are not gonna produce very large bulbs if you cut all the tops off. They need those tops to make the bulbs. Um, whereas chives don't really produce bulbs. Their purpose is to produce the tops. Um, they're also perennial. They come back year after year and they taste better than onion tops of the bulb onions. These have a sweeter taste or just a friendlier taste than the other ones. So those are the main reasons why. We have both garlic chives and onion chives in our garden. Um, the way you can tell the difference if you ever plant them and forget what you have the garlic chives have flat leaves, and the onion chives have circular, hollow, round ones. I can pass these around if anyone wants to see what we're talking about. And like I said, don't forget to eat those flowers. <laughs> <laughs> so many people just think that they, they aren't edible, but gosh, they taste great. And it's fun eating something purple. Okay, so talked about onions and chives. Um, let's talk about some other types we haven't talked about. We haven't talked about berries yet. Oh, yes. So let's talk about blackberries because they are the easiest, um, in my opinion, the easiest fruit to grow. Ours grow like a weed, I feel like. <laughs> yeah, they're native to Oklahoma, so they just they know what to do here. Um, they have, so typically blackberries have had thorns. They have varieties now that are thornless. Um, we planted two or three bushes, two bushes, two. three years ago. And now we've got five or six bushes that came up on their own. So they're, they're really prolific. Um, you need to, well, you don't have to contain them with a the trellis, but it makes it easier because it'll take over an area. Uh, the easiest way that we found to trellis them is to take, and the cheapest, is to take the hardware remesh panels that you can get from the hardware store. So if you go to the concrete section, you may have seen this before, when they're laying concrete, they lay these mesh panels of, of wire, basically, you know, of, um, of, and, um, the point is they're, they're eight dollars at the hardware store and they're four by eight for you know So you can buy those and then attach them to t-posts with zip ties and then um, that you can build like a little area for the for the blackberries to stay in We also use that same strategy for our trellises for peppers and tomatoes and pretty much everything peas and all sorts of stuff like that Thank you um, As far as how to use blackberries, I mean I think everybody knows how great blackberries are. You just, you eat them. I know. I'm guilty. I, I love food, apparently. I get really excited about all of these. Um, blackberries hardly ever make it into our house. We are very guilty of that. We, Me and all of the kids, we just go out there and just start picking them and eating them right there on the spot. But if we ever have leftovers, they make an amazing blackberry pie. So, my favorite. Um, so, with blackberries, the first year that they grow, um, they're not gonna produce the fruit on that vine the first year. The way they grow is they produce the long vine and then the second year is when fruit produces on that vine. So it takes two years to get fruit from it. Um, and with that idea in mind too, don't prune the, when you go to prune at the end of the year, don't prune the ones that haven't produced fruit yet. Once they produce fruit, now you can prune those, they're spent. So same thing applies to raspberries as well. Um, let's go to what variety of blackberry? Um, I went with uh, the variety, I don't know if they're even in here. Uh, yeah, Osage was one of them. And I don't, it was, it was a Native American name. So the, 
Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm, it was the Wachita, because it was, oh, yes. yeah, it yes, was the Wachita variety. Wachita, O U, yeah. But generally, the, the, the varieties that have a Native American name in them um, are good for this area, because they originated around here. So, um, blackberries are, they're just really easy to grow here. Now, uh, let's talk about blueberries, because you do need to consider the variety, especially for blueberries. There are blueberries that do not like the heat, and some that do better with the heat. So, any of the southern varieties, so like this blueberry collection here. Um, now blueberry does, blueberries do not like our soil because our soil is uh, very alkaline and they like acidic soil. So with blueberries especially, we'll, we grow them inside of smart pots. So a 20 gallon smart pot and then you can use this soil acidifier here to adjust the, the pH of the soil in just that smart pot. So that's the biggest thing with blueberries is they do take a different type of soil. And you really don't have to worry about this with most, most anything else. Tomatoes like a little bit of acidic soil too, but blueberries are really the biggest ones you've got to worry about with this. Now blueberries are great, of course, just right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we actually add blueberries a lot to like our oatmeal and um, smoothies, things like that. It's really good. Okay, so let's talk about some other things. So broccoli and cabbage, we started indoors in our house in February, February. very beginning of February. Now you can start them indoors as early as January. Um, they just get bigger, so um, t it takes more room indoors. So, so we started ours around the beginning of, of February. Uh, the reason for that is that if you plant broccoli directly um, by seed, uh, outdoors whenever the, the window opens, you may not get it in time. It, it, it takes, especially for the broccoli varieties that grow the, the large heads, uh, you may not have it by the time that, um, by the time it gets too hot. So we've adjusted our thinking on broccoli in a way, and now we we grow more of these types of broccoli that produce a bunch of smaller heads quickly. So this one is in 50 days, you've got smaller heads that you can harvest as opposed to uh, some of these other ones, you know, like um, I know there's some that are 90 days in here, or like, yeah, there's some in here that are 90, where it takes you that whole time for that large head to develop. And with broccoli, um, we used to eat the whole head, but then you want to tell them about how we switched yeah, that? Yeah, so a few years ago, we had a really bad hailstorm, and all of our plants just got destroyed. So we were like researching, what do we do with these? Because we felt so bad, like these plants are right there. We're like, can we eat these leaves? And we discovered that you could, they were edible. And a great way to prepare them is to stir fry them and they taste incredible in a stir fry. Um, like he always says that they taste exactly like the inside of an egg roll because that's cabbage inside of it. And oh wow, it, it tastes great. It adds a really great flavor to stir fries. So we like broccoli more in that way than we do the full size heads. Um, uh, you can also start broccoli, um, so if you're going to do those types especially, you can start it from seed out, outdoors just as, by, uh, by uh, sprinkling seed everywhere. Uh, one thing I want to mention on, on broccoli is, again, we used to think about growing as one plant. Now we'll, we'll sprinkle a, a whole section of broccoli seeds and then thin them down as they grow and then leave the, the strongest one remaining and then we'll eat those thinnings as microgreens. And, okay, um, broccoli is going to have so uh, I mentioned this earlier with kale, broccoli is going to have the same pest problem with the cabbage worms. So these white moths, when you see them flying around, uh, get rid of those. Uh, there's a cool salt gun you can get that's fun to go <laughs> hunt them with. I spent like two hours one day in the backyard hunting these he things with a salt gun. He has way too much gun. fun out there with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but again, I mentioned earlier that uh, for these cabbage worms, you can use this insect netting and you can put it uh, over your plants and that'll, that'll help. But, this uh, BT is, again, not a pesticide. It's a naturally occurring soil bacteria that helps control them. We've got it on there twice. See that? Because it works that great. Well, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure they see it. Um, okay. So now let's talk, let's talk about cabbage because we planted it around the same time that we planted broccoli. And we have similar strategies with cabbage as we have with broccoli in that we're not growing it for the large cabbage head. We're growing the varieties more like... They're uh, under bok choy. They're under bok choy, mm -hmm. okay. 
We're growing more of... Oh, thank you. By the way, if you haven't got a coupon yet, we're giving away smart pots here uh, in... About 10 minutes. 12 minutes. Ooh. 10 minutes. I said minutes. about 10. Okay. So. 12 minutes we're giving away <laughs> Give smart pots. Um, okay, so cabbage. These are the types of cabbage we typically grow that produce a bunch of smaller leaves. The it's also Asian called cabbages. bok choy. Yeah, bok choy, yeah. Um, there's a lot of different types of them, but that's, that, that's typically more of what we grow um, with cabbage, just because with, with a cabbage head, there's a lot of opportunity for things to go wrong without things growing. There's a lot of pests and tornadoes and hailstorms and everything else that can attack it. Uh, we're in more, so we're used to the tornadoes attacking us every other year. <laughs> Um, attacking us. That's happening my whole life. <laughs> I, I came out and they started attacking me. Um, cabbage, so it says transplant here, but again, you can, you can sow it by seed, especially with the Asian cabbages. The, they, they do well from seed. Um, as far as cooking it, it's basically the same as broccoli. I, like yeah. we're chopping it up and putting it in stir fries stir mostly. Fries. That's great. Although we do have a coleslaw recipe in here. Yeah. Um, we don't have it. Yeah, we do. It should be in there. Uh-oh. What did I do? I, I don't know what you did. We do have a coleslaw recipe on our website. Um, I don't like coleslaw typically, but this is a recipe that I actually actually do like. So we, we, we all have cabbage for that. We'll also make sauerkraut, so you can ferment your cabbage and make sauerkraut as well. Um, I don't think we have a guide for that yet. We no. need to make one of those. Okay, let's move on to what should we talk about next? We haven't talked about beets yet. Yeah. We did just plant some of those. So beets are very similar to carrots in that they take a while to germinate and they have to remain moist while they're, uh, until they do. So you can either do like an automated irrigation system or cover them with burlap or something like that to help keep the sun off until they're germinating. We don't, well up until recently, we have not really grown beets for, um, for the beets, for the, the roots as much. We've mostly grown them for the tops they produce because it's a nice mix that you can put in salads to kind of change up the, the flavor a little bit. Um, but she figured out how to add the, the roots into our diet recently. Yeah, so we have a, what is it, Brevel? Brevel, yeah. Brevel juicer, and I love adding just a beet into there, and you can add the greens as well, and, um, and they taste amazing. It adds a really good flavor to the juice, and our, even our two and three-year-old love them. They are very yeah. overpowering. It, they, it tastes good. So I, I add it in there. And I do I do carrots and, I mean, all sorts of things, apples, oranges, you know, and they love it. Yeah. Beets are overpowering, so you got to take, yeah. take it easy with them a That's little bit. That's why I was never a big fan of them until I figured out I can juice them. And then I was like, oh, okay, I can do this. <laughs> yeah, and they're good in a juice, especially with those other flavors. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so You'd let's be surprised. filter. You might, you might like it. <laughs> so, so far, I think we've covered what we have in our garden, but peas. Let's talk about peas. So, we haven't. So, again, it's a little past the season to plant peas outside. You could probably get away with planting an early variety. By that, I mean a variety that's quick to mature. So, one of these, like 56 day varieties, something like that, would be a good one to, to go with. Um, peas are one of our favorite things to grow, uh, they're really easy to grow. And they also help the other plants in your garden. The way that they do that is by taking nitrogen out of the air and putting it into the soil and storing it into their into the roots. Uh, peas and beans are some of the only plants that can actually do that. So having them around your other plants that need nitrogen just makes it to where it's a system where you've got plants helping each other. So we have um, we have peas pretty much along the north row of every single one of our beds that has one of these trellises on it. Let me pull up this picture again. So see these trellises here that are T-posts and then those wire things I mentioned? We've got, we've got peas growing up, each one of those on the north side of our bed. And then sometimes we'll have it on the west side of our bed too. Um, so that those peas will then shade other crops in the afternoon. Um, so we have a lot of like spinaches and things like that that are heat sensitive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is our backyard here. We started in 2015. And I, I get obsessed with things. <laughs> <laughs> this is my thing. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, it changed my life. Um, she, she, so when I met Carrie, my wife here, um, I've dealt with anxiety and depression my whole life, but she was the first person that helped me figure out how we could manage it. Um, so we found this book called The Depression Cure, 
and it talked about how we could help manage anxiety and depression through basically eating the right food, drinking a lot of water, uh, being mindful, uh, just these six basic areas of my life. And uh, we started journaling and charting everything we ate and everything we did. And, and um, this is what led to, I mean, this helped me. So uh, we're excited to get growing again because this winter I've been eating a bunch of junk food and I gained a bunch of weight. And, <laughs> I'm excited to get back out in the garden and feeling better again. But this we is, have spinach out there now. Yeah, that's why we're here today, because this changed our life, and we wanted to make an app to make it easy for other people to, to do the same thing. So with that idea in mind, we actually have a section in the app, uh, this Grow for Health section that, that Carrie, uh, Carrie developed, that um, you can choose from over 26 different health conditions here, and it'll show you the plants that help with those uh, conditions. So if you choose heart health, we're going to show you um, all the plants that help with heart health. So it can, it can help. Yes, this is in our app, yeah. And this is also a web app that works on any computer. So it's on iPhone, Android, iPad. Uh, from any computer, you can go to app.cdspoon.net and that, that works as well. Um, okay, so let's, let's go, where, where we were talking about? We were talking about peace. Peace, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I get off track sometimes. Um, peace, we have this really cute, picture of, uh, of our daughter. Um, she loves peas. And peas are one of those things that when she was a baby, she was just devouring them. And peas are one of those things, if you've never had them fresh out of a garden, then you're missing out because peas that come from the store have lost all the, the sweetness from the pea is gone in like a day. You can't even wait that long. So they rarely make it into the house for us unless they're going straight into a stir fry. We eat them right off the vine. And it's, it's nice because it's a really nice snack to have. Uh, I work from home a lot as a software developer, so I spend a lot of time out in the garden just going out there and snacking, and, and it keeps me from snacking on other stuff. I'll go out there and have a couple peas. If it's the summer, I'll have some okra, a couple spinach leaves. Uh, sometimes I'll just pull up a whole onion and just eat it. Um, you know, like, but doing that type of stuff, it really makes me feel better. Um, and peas are one of those things that it's really easy to do with. There's not a lot of pests with peas, really. Um, you're going to have mostly aphids. That's going to be the biggest issue with them. But um, so. We're gonna, so the thing about peas, like I mentioned earlier, peas, they help other plants around them. Um, the other plants that help with that in the same way are beans. Um, let me go to beans for a second. Uh, and then southern peas. And all of those, and the reason why I mentioned those is because we have one of those three things going in our garden all the time. Either peas, so it's peas starting out in the spring, and then uh, we'll plant peas until St. Patrick's Day. And then, at, and then at St. Patrick's Day, we'll switch to lima beans. Um, we haven't planted them yet, but that's, the, the, that's generally what we do is from St. Patrick's Day until April 8th or so is lima beans. And then we switch to bush or pole beans um, all the way until May or June. Um, and then we switch to southern peas. And the logic behind that is all these different things just like different temperatures. So the peas like the coolest, and then lima beans, and then beans, and then southern. So and then, and then you go back down the scale the other way of in the fall, uh, you go back down into beans and then back down into peas. So we've got one of those going, I, I even say year round because peas are a good cover crop, meaning they'll last throughout the winter. You can plant them in the fall and then let them kind of lay on top of your garden and just kind of sit there over the winter and it'll, it'll provide a blanket basically for your bed so the soil life doesn't get frozen out and the soil isn't meant to be bare. That's not how soil, like soil doesn't like being empty. It likes having stuff in it. So, and then having that, those peas in there that are overwintering and then that nitrogen that they stored is being released back in the soil. And then in the spring you chop them um, and then plant something new in the place. So we've got, you know, these going pretty much year round. As far as beans are concerned, uh, there's two main types of beans. There's bush beans and there's pole beans. So bush beans grow to like three feet tall and produce a, bush, a bunch of beans at once, um, sometimes two rounds, and then they're done. Uh, they're really handy to have because it's great for, especially for canning or preservation or just, we have a large family, so we just need a bunch of beans. Um, <laughs> it's great for that. Uh, pole beans, on the other hand, um, continue producing until it freezes. So, or continue growing and producing until it freezes, but they don't produce all at once, they produce, you know, Here's five beans, here's five beans. You know what I mean? It's just kind of continue to give, continue, continues to give you beans. Um, <laughs> as far as how to plant beans are concerned, it is one of the easiest things to grow. So the bush beans are nine per square. 
So again, the square foot gardening method, basically you take your garden, divide it up into a squares, and then each plant has a number of how many can be planted per square. So with beans, it's nine. So with beans, it's every yellow hole you would put a bean in. Um, does all this make sense as far as square foot? Okay. Um, and uh, with bush beans, it, it may sound like a lot as far as fitting into there. They are gonna be kind of crammed together, but the beans like that, that they'll help hold each other up. So, uh, and what we'll do with beans is we'll alternate. So we'll have square of beans, maybe square of carrots, rosemary, beans, square of beets. So you, know, you, you get the idea. I'm, I'm mixing different things together. And to decide what we mix together with it, we're using this tab here, this friends tab, to look to see what grows well next to beans. And then we can see and kind of go from there. And then that's kind of how, how we plan out our garden. Um, as far as cooking beans and using I mean, them. Yeah, beans and peas are really easy to add into your diet. One of our favorite ways to eat it is just simply by sauteing onions and garlic again and putting in either beans or peas and sauteing them all together. It tastes great that way. Um, we also add these a lot to our stir fries. And they're, they're good just fresh off the vine too. Yes. Now they do have... Uh, it, some people don't like it fresh off the vine because it's a little bit tougher, but a way that you can break that down quickly is just to steam it for like three or four minutes. So that's all it takes and a little bit of olive oil or salt or pepper, like she said. Um, but they're one of our favorite things to grow because they're really easy to grow. You get a lot of beans out of it. And pretty um, much all of the kids love it. Yeah, the so kids love it. it. <laughs> there's a lot of different colors. Again, there's purple. She loves yes, the purple ones. I do. There's yellow. <laughs> there's all sort of, sorts of beans. Yes, sir, you have a question. We don't can anything. We freeze. So if we do any preservation, we freeze. It's not that we're against canning. We're just, we don't have space and time. It's easier and... for me to freeze. I have freeze. I have frozen, I guess. Sorry. <laughs> I have frozen these before. Um, you just have to, um, you know, put them in the boiling water for a little bit and then move them over to an ice bath. And then you can put them in the freezer. But... And we've got guides and videos on the more tab in the app here for beans. Um, we've got videos and blog posts here that show um, you know, like how this is how, how we have the constant supply of beans talks about some of the stuff we've got stir fry recipes here's the other recipe she was mentioning how we preserve them all that kind of stuff we've got in here all right so it's three o'clock we're gonna do another smart pot giveaway so if you don't have a ticket yet everybody have a ticket oh, no time oh, we got more coming got more coming ticket now or forever and or whatever <laughs> I don't know there's a way <laughs> it, to say until that. 30 minutes okay yeah we're having another one at the at 332 so Okay, Hold on, I'm, so I'm first, well, if we got to tell them what, okay. what they're winning. I'm mixing them really so good. So the first one is a seven gallon smart pot. So these are a great size for any individual plant, uh, herb, uh, anything like that. Now it's a little small for a big tomato or squash plant. But other than that, you can plant pretty much anything in it. These are especially a great size for this strategy that we use in the summer, where we take four or five of these on of this size and put them inside of a kiddie pool and then fill that kiddie pool with a couple inches of water and then they'll drink water from below. So you can't put too much water in there, you'll drown the roots, but two inches is perfect. Uh, and then you just refill it every other day or so. Um, and that's a really easy way to keep things watered in the summer. So seven gallon smart pot going okay, to- here we go. 366. Last three digits. Oh, is that you? We got a winner. Woo! All right. Nice. So this one is a 15 gallon smart pot. This one you could fit a, um, you could definitely fit a uh, one of, of anything, so a large, uh, a large tomato plant, squash, anything like that will fit in here. Um, but you could also fit like three or four herbs in here. So like rosemary, sage, thyme, like three or four different things. But pretty much everything that's this size or larger for us becomes potatoes. We grow a lot of potatoes in these because it's easy to harvest. You just dump them out um, and then the kids go through and they might get me, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't know why he was laughing. I was like, what was funny about potatoes, Patrick? Whatever. Because <laughs> okay. you're whacking me in the face. Sorry. <laughs> um, so anyway, this is great for potatoes, sweet potatoes, things like that. Okay, here we go. 3.56. We got a winner. Ooh, winner. Awesome. Woo. If you did not win, uh, we do have smart pots for sale over here. Um, and we also are going to be giving away more at 3.30 and at 4 o'clock, every 30 minutes. We're